The first example is this. Okay, so if this was x squared plus 1, then you know exactly what to do. The answer is arctan. my beloved arctan. But with, with x squared minus 1, that is not in the table of derivatives. That is not in a form where you're ready to recognize where this came from. And no amount of trickery will really help you get there. The kind of trickery that we've engaged in until now, which is maybe throwing in an x squared and then subtracting x squared. None of that will really get you there. It'll get you into some circuitous arguments and won't really help you. So the idea that does work is to factor the polynomial in the denominator. So take that as sort of your mini goal always. Factor the polynomial in the denominator if you're able to do this. Everybody's familiar with the difference of squares formula, right? So why does this help? It's still not in a form where you can recognize where this came from. However, you can break this up into two simpler fractions, as you're about to see. One will have this factor on the bottom, the other one will have this factor on the bottom. In each one of those, you'll be able to integrate. And this is called partial fractions. You're always able to do this. The only question is, what goes into the numerators? And for a problem this simple, we can just guess. In a moment, we'll get a little bit more sophisticated and, and we'll have a more general method for deciding what goes on top. But for now, you can actually just guess. And so, let's try one and one. So, you, once again, you always have to be better at the forward operation, which is combining these two fractions, than the inverse operation of breaking them apart. But if this was... 1 and 1. Imagine now adding these two fractions together, and you know what happens. You have to multiply this numerator by this denominator, and this numerator by this denominator, right? That's what involved in adding two fractions, especially when you're just directly multiplying their denominators. There are no common there are no common multiples, no, no common factors among the denominators, so it's a straight addition. So this gets multiplied by x plus 1. This gets multiplied by x minus 1. When you combine them, you get 2x on top, because plus 1 and minus 1 cancel each other. So that's not, that doesn't work. That's not what we want to have on top. We want to have 1 on top. So the two x's need to cancel each other. So I'll just subtract 1. So now we have x plus 1 minus x minus 1. And the two x's now cancel. And so we have 2 instead of 1. We want to have 1. So we actually need 1 half of the first one and 1 <coughs> half of the second one. Did you follow that? So I think that rather than doing what we'll do next with more complicated things, you can kind of just want to wing it a little bit. And just find, grope for the two numbers that would work and you'll find them. Okay. So if you're at all confused by how I did this, some of the following examples will clarify it, so don't worry about it. But for now, just you can just directly check that if I were to combine these two fractions, I'll end up precisely with this, and therefore this. Okay? And now the problem is pretty much solved, because each one of these can be easily integrated. Am I right? What's the key word? Log. Of course. It's just 1 over x minus 1 doesn't matter, and 1 over x plus 1 doesn't matter. Okay? So we end up having... I think there will be questions, or there should be questions. Okay, 
We're going to review how to get these coefficients if you couldn't have guessed them, okay? So that's a separate task. That's not a matter of integration. That's just a matter of modifying the integrand. Here is the complete procedure. We start out with this expression. Here, the fraction is quote-unquote combined. There's, a common, there's just one fraction, one denominator, and so forth. But whatever the factors are in the denominator, whatever the factors are in the denominator, we can represent this single fraction as a sum of two fractions. One of them will have x minus 1 in the denominator, and the other one will have x plus 1 in the denominator. So right now, I don't know what's on top. So I will denote what goes on top here by a, and it's a constant, and what goes in the numerator here by b. And here is one rule in all of this. The numerator, the degree of the numerator, has to be less than the degree of the denominator. The degree is the highest power that you see in the denominator. In this case, it's x to the power of 1. So this is called a first-order polynomial, first-degree polynomial, also known as a linear polynomial. So whatever you see on the bottom, what you have on top is always one degree less. So here we have just a constant. That's all we have left when the degree needs to be one less. So that, that's, that will be a common occurrence in all of the examples. So now if you want to determine what a and b are, you just have to recombine this. Let's continue with simplifying this. I will multiply this out and combine the like terms in one step. It'll be a plus b times x. So that's the linear term. And the constant term is a minus b, because it's a from here and minus b from here. Now comes the matching step. We have to match up this with what we have here. Here we have a linear function where the linear coefficient is a plus b and the constant coefficient is a minus b. We have to match it up with a polynomial that only has a free coefficient and it equals 1. So a plus b, the coefficient that multiplies x, must be 0. And a minus b, which is the free coefficient, the constant coefficient, must be 1. So we're kind of ending up, not kind of, actually ending up with two equations for a and b, where a plus b equals 0, because the coefficient multiplying x is 0, and a minus b equals 1. And now... We have to solve this system with two equations and two unknowns. And in this case, it's easy. The first equation says that a and b must be opposites of each other. So something like 1 and what, 1 and minus 1, 2 and minus 2, and so on. And their difference equals 1. So they've got to be 1 half and minus 1 half. And so a equals 1 half. But let's not lose sight of the main point. This procedure takes you from something that you don't know how to differentiate, integrate, to something that you do. And how you determine the coefficient is actually an algebraic detail that has nothing to do with calculus. Pure algebra. One thing you might ask me is, what if the numerator has the degree that's higher than the degree of the denominator, or equals it. So, same or higher. What do you do then? That's a separate question that we'll save for another day.